Thanks for coming, sir. Thanks for having me. So in the other stage, it was all set up that we were going to sit on these chairs. Maybe this is I'll nice just... and awkward. You're so far away. I know. All right, let me sit right here. All right. So Jason has, has started four companies. He sold two of them for cash. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. And he's currently uh, working on WP Engine. And when I say working on, he just raised, they just raised their 41st million dollar of, that wasn't grammatically correct, but he just raised, they've raised $41 million and they're at around 265 employees. So, um, but what I like, what I've always liked about Jason and his writing and his, his sharing with our community is that he's a bootstrapper at heart and he has, uh, he just, he always bootstraps the businesses to the point where it makes sense. There's a certain point where it just makes sense to raise funding and that's, that's what he's done. So, um, I have a few questions that I'm going to kick us off with. Okay, so Jason validated, or I guess I should ask it to you. So you validated WP Engine. You famously talked about getting 30 people or 40 people to pay you 99 bucks a month, right? You made a bunch of phone calls, a bunch of emails, and you got them to commit to paying you that. I actually used a very similar process when I uh, validated Drip. I only got 10 people, but it was, it was my go-ahead. Um, is that still the approach you would recommend to someone in the audience today? Yeah, uh, definitely. I think um, people tend to, first of all, when you go out to validate an idea, the thing is your idea is pretty okay. Like you're not an idiot. You're not, your, your idea is not just complete crap. And so you go out and you talk to a few people. They're probably people you know or they're closer in your circles in some way because, of course, it's hard to talk to strangers. And so you quote unquote validate the idea after talking to maybe five people. And of course, that isn't really validation because you're not really trying to invalidate, which is the, the job. So <clears throat> before I had the idea for uh, WP Engine, I had an idea for another thing. And I validated that, except I invalidated it. And um, uh, it, it's also instructive, this, uh, the failure to validate was, also, was actually more instructive because of how. Because I would explain what the product did, and the first thing everyone would say is, that's perfect, I need that, which sounds like validation. Except the next set of stuff that they would say would be different. And so one person would say, that's perfect. And you know what it should do is, is cost $5,000 a month, and you should sell it through agencies, and they should do this and that. And the next person says, that's perfect. You know what you should do is take that and make it just for ad tech and do that. And someone else would say, that's great. You know what you should do is make that a freemium model, and you can get millions of people to use it and all this kind of stuff, right? And so actually, the, the, what happened next was divergent. And now it's a signal it's actually not a good idea, even though the first thing they said was, that's a good idea. Um, and so it feels like a good conversation. And so um, it's important to run down the sort of full view of what the person, how the other person's thinking. It's important to talk about price, because price does determine the product. I just talked to someone over lunch who had collected over 120 emails of people who were interested in the product, which is great, except he didn't ask any of them if they would buy it. And it's actually not clear that they will. They're just interested. And if they do buy it, will they pay a dollar or a thousand dollars a month? Because that's pretty different. And so I think these things like price aren't things to be overlooked. And you should go in thinking, I, I want to invalidate my idea and run those down to see whether they diverge. Because um, e even a decent idea can diverge and make it a bad one. And when you talk to them about price, do you say, would you pay $99? Or with the first few, did you kind of say, what's this worth to you until you gauge something and then fixed on a number? Yeah, I always threw a price out there. And usually I was, and, and for both WP Engine actually and this other, um, this other company, I use 50 bucks a month. I'm, I'm actually not sure why. It just seemed like a thing to do, place to start. So I think, um, you know, if people aren't flinching, then that's a good sign to state something bigger. And if they say, whoa, I thought it would be free until X, Y, Z, then that tells you something else. So I think, um, I think throwing out a number is useful. There's, there's some circles or some talk about um, instead of just getting someone to commit to purchasing, that you should get a you know a check that you're not going to cash, or you should even get you know get their credit card number, charge you 50 bucks, and say when you know if, if you don't want to when I build it, I'll refund it or whatever. Like actually get payment up front. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, definitely do that. And now they're square, so you can take credit cards. And I would absolutely cash those checks. Are you kidding me? They just give you a check, cash it. Um, you can always give it back later. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Um, I mean, so the ultimate version of this, of course, is crowdfunding, right? And so you go on Kickstarter or, some, or Indie or something like that, and, and uh, that's another form of validation. There's actually an interesting effect. If you look at what's happened with things like Kickstarter, it turns out that it's not as much validation as you would think it would be. You'd think that if someone gives you a total of 30 grand to do something, or a set of people, that that's validation. Um, but actually, because that's, that, doesn't, that is not a distribution system that you can repeat, 
And so it turns out that those extremely early adopters may in fact not represent a market that you can repeat. And so uh, of course it's better than nothing. Get the money and go and build it, right? So, so don't not do it, but it's actually not validation. It's tr getting the engine turned over, which is also useful. Sure. Okay. So you validated WP Engine, which was, um, if I recall, the early it's it's WordPress hosting, but the early idea was that it was super fast, super reliable, right? Right. Um, I've also validated Drip, which at the time I was saying email marketing software built for startups. What if someone has something that they're building that is too complicated, or or it, yeah, it's too complicated to describe in four words? Yeah. So I don't believe in that. Um, I mean, if Google can describe what they do by saying, you know, organize the world's information, and they're making self-driving cars and Gmail both, then you can do it too. Um, so I think what happens when you cannot boil it down into a short phrase is either you're not sure what it is, actually you haven't gotten to the root of what is it, what's the important, interesting thing about it, um, uh, but you, know, you haven't articulated that, maybe because you don't know or maybe just because you haven't figured out what the words are, it's the hardest thing to make the shortest. Um, the, sh the shortest phrase, um, and and so I just I just simply don't believe that you can't um, do that. And anyway, you're going to have to put headlines on your uh, and buttons, headlines and buttons on your uh, uh, on your homepage. So you're going to have to figure out some phrase of what it is. You're going to have to do that in AdWords. You're going to have to put it on your T-shirt. You're going to do those things, right? So you're going to have to boil it down. So let's do that now. Um, and and uh, and I think the, the the trouble and actually um, a lot of the stuff that Joanna was saying before is is. Um, is actually applicable, which is the job of the of the phrase is not to do everything, to say what it is and how much it costs and what the market is and you know how you're going to get there is not the job. The job is is if you're the right target person, then you should say, oh, that actually sounds interesting. Tell me more. Right? That's the job of that of that little statement, or to align what you are going to do or not do. All right. So Google is actually a great example. Uh, organizing the world's information. But they make all their money on ads. So how come the phrase doesn't say selling ads? It's actually because the more information they get, the better they can be at selling ads, the more accurate and the more ads. So although ads is the business, the mission is to organize information, in other words, to know everything they can about all of us at all times, because that power, that's what they monetize, and they mostly monetize that through ads, but not necessarily always. So that's why that mission statement is not even a description of the business model or the market. It's a description of what is the most important thing for them to always be pushing forward so that they can do other things. So they have to organize maps because otherwise a self-driving car doesn't know anything. And they have to organize w websites or else they can't search and they have to, et cetera. They organize your behavior or else they can't give you good ads. It actually does come from that one place. Cool. Okay, so hypothetical situation. You imagine that you have something that's working. You have a product, uh, a business, but it's not working as well as you would like. How do you know when to quit and when to push forward? Because it's more obvious when it's not working at all, but it's always hard when it's kind of working. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the graph that um, uh, I want to say patio Patrick put up <laughs> um, with the point reminders is a perfect example. It's a growing business, but it's growing really slowly and it's painful. So what do you do with that information, right? That's, that's a toughie. So I think, um, so first of all, the, the, there, there's, you know, Seth, uh, Seth Godin wrote a whole book about this called The Dip. I and mean, if you read that whole book at the end, you'll, you'll go, I still don't know what to do. Like it's absolutely <laughs> useless, and, um, which is kind of typical actually, you know, so that doesn't help. I mean, because ultimately there's not gonna be a clear like formula to say, right? So that's the problem. I think um, what Patrick said actually about whether it's worth doing, um, actually what Jacob was saying too about if, is this what you wanna do with your life? Are you happy to wake up every day is actually a pretty good metric to use. It's, it's maybe hard to be introspective and to separate out your ambition and what you, what you would like yourself to be from what's happening and whether you're happy doing it. Um, that's difficult, but if you can be introspective and honest in that way, then that is actually the path to decide, hey, the revenue's not growing fast enough, and I love it, so who cares, versus the revenue's not growing fast enough, and I hate it. So, um, I mean, look, being an entrepreneur is fundamentally, um, it's almost always a bad financial choice. Like, what Patrick should do financially is just be a consultant and make 30K a, a week and do that once a month, and that's probably maximizes his money, right? But of course he won't do that because he wants to do other things. But so f financially, everything's gonna be slower than you want. Nothing's gonna take off the way you want. People won't react the way you wish they would. The, the marketing campaigns won't be as effective as you wish. And everything's gonna take longer and harder because it's life. And that's how it works, whether you're remodeling your kitchen or building software or baking a company, it doesn't matter, right? That's life. And so, uh, of course, the, 
it's how you're feeling in, in it um, that matters. And to separate out the stress and pain and risk and the other things, you know, you're working another job or you have a family, which is another job, and all these things that you're sacrificing, it's very hard to separate that fact from, but is what I'm doing something important? Um, so I think that's important. I think um, what Steve Jobs uh, said is in the morning he'd wake up and say, if this were my last day alive, which actually um, we now know is something that was a, a question that was hovering over him for a long time, um, would I want to do what I'm about to do? Which doesn't mean, will I love every moment of it, but it does mean, will I be fulfilled by it? Will I be proud of doing it? Am I glad that I'm going to do it? I mean, certainly, I know everyone in here is the same, but I can say, like, I do not love every moment <laughs> at the company and most things that you have to do, um, you don't really want to. Um, you know, as, as engineers, you want to just make new features, and that's probably not the right thing to do next for the business, right? It's probably distribution, website stuff, getting new customers, tech support, finding out the next thing to do, um, maybe hiring the next consultant or ODesk person or employee or whatever. Like, that's probably what you should be working on because that probably would help the business the most. But what you want to do is open up the IDE and make a feature because it's fun and you understand it, you don't have to talk to anybody. But it's, it's, it's comfortable, but it's not probably the right thing to do. So most things, I think, as entrepreneurs that we have to do are things we don't want to because we're a little uncomfortable and, and it's not the fun part. Um, but you ask, like, is this correct? Is this fulfilling? If the answer is yes, there you go. So I think, um, again, trying to separate that from, um, from uh, you know, it's just not working um, is, is just difficult. And I think in this community especially, we have a little more luxury to do that because most folks haven't taken investor money and maybe not, you know, have the flexibility to shut something down if, if it isn't working instead of having to see it through. Okay, um, product market fit, phrase bandied about a lot, but I'm gonna say it here, meaning this is where kind of the rubber meets the road and things start scaling up. Basically, it means you've built something people want, your churn's going down, a lot of people are converting, it's easier to communicate uh, your value prop and it's just working. What, till, I guess the first question is kind of do you, uh, I'm sure you've seen this product market fit in, in some of your products that you've grown. What tells you that you've hit it? And what is your process for hitting it quickly? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that you can, you can decide to hit it quickly. I mean, some of these questions, you know, how do you succeed? These are things where if there was an answer, then, um, you know, we wouldn't need conferences and venture capital would actually be good at their jobs. And so <laughs> clearly there's not a good way to predict it, even if it's your job to do it. Um, so what does it feel like? That's a good question because at each of my four companies, we've achieved it and it definitely feels different. And again, like I've only raised money this last time, right? All the rest were bootstrapped and so on and so. Um, and, and of course, WP Engine was, was bootstrapped until post product market fit as well. Um, so um, <clears throat> there's definitely a palpable change in the struggle that it is, um, where uh, as a consultant, I think the, 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 turn, the turning point is when you're, you are just telling people no all the time instead of scrabbling to find the next, uh, the, the, the next thing to do. Um, and, 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 and getting to choose that, maybe, of course, raising your rates as, at the same time in order to winnow down who you're dealing with, or at least being able to be more choosy about who you work with. I think for a consultant, that's kind of what that looks like when you've achieved this sort of thing. For product, um, um, you, you know, usually you can just see it in the metrics. I mean, what it looks like is you start growing faster all of a sudden, and you look around and say, why? And there's not really a great reason. Like you didn't, you, you're not spending a lot more in ads or you didn't do some new social campaign or like you didn't really have a new release, like it just changed and you don't really have an explanation. And uh, which is kind of cool, kind of weird, like I kind of want, you know, you want to understand the mechanics of the business, but on the other hand, that's what it looks like when suddenly there's a sea change, there's some critical math going on, whatever that means. And so for us that happened in January, at WP Engine it happened in January of 2012. And we know because, uh, b besides you can see it um, in a literal hockey stick with like the, the low thing and then the thing like that, um, which by the way has nothing to do with funding, it just can happen, right? Um, and it suddenly happened and, and you know, again, we are asking why. And it's kind of unclear, like we started going to these conferences four months before, but there was no immediate change from going to the conference, so why in January? And you could say, well, people came back from holidays, right? But it never ended, so why, why, would, why did that stick? That should have been a lower holiday bump in January and then back to business as usual, and it just never went down, so why is that? Um, so we can invent all kinds of reasons, but it just occurred, and I, and I actually think that happens. In, in, uh, in Smart Bear, it was similar, in IT Watchdogs, um, um, it was similar as well. The things just, just worked better, and, and there, there was no good explanation, and that's actually a signal. And what were you doing during that time? You know, let's say the six months before, the year before, 
you were obviously, there were folks writing code, there were folks doing marketing. Do you feel, were you moving towards something? Or, or was it kind of like we were just throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and eventually, boom, in January, it, it kind of locked in? Um, yeah, I definitely feel like uh, my path has always been, and all my companies has been a, a, a random walk that's trying to seek something. So like at SmartBear, the company was founded to, because I wanted to learn .NET. Um, that was a mistake, <laughs> but that's what I wanted to do. I felt like, oh, Microsoft Platform is moving along. This is like 2001 or something. I'm like, oh, I need to keep up with what's going on. And so I'll do this weird thing that integrates with version control that I just sort of wanted. And it wasn't that good of a product. It didn't sell that well. And then eventually, I discovered that people were abusing it to do code review. And then I was like, oh, code review, fine. I'll just add these features. And I still didn't understand this is a market that can exist that doesn't exist yet. OK, so eventually I realized this. And um, we actually re rewrote everything in Java, which was wise. Usually the full rewrite's bad. But when it's .NET, it's, just, it's wise. <laughs> and, um, and, and, it, and it really took off once we figured out code review was actually the thing. But there was none, no sense of that at the beginning whatsoever. Um, I think uh, um, even with WP Engine, um, of course, now, uh, you know, once you're at scale, you have to be predictable and so on because you have to hire and do other things that take uh, a lot of lead time. And so you have to be, have some predictability so that you can do that. Um, but even so, um, you know, we've, we've seen the rise of enterprise customers, which, again, has nothing to do with raising money. Um, SmartBear was almost completely enterprise customers, and that was me with zero salespeople. So this has nothing to do with raising money. But it just happened. And, and again, is this a market change, or did we, did we get a new fit? Um, you could argue about it, but, the, but you know, we went from almost none of our revenue being those kind of Fortune 100 uh, brands to all of a sudden large percentages of our revenue and a growing percentage is that. And so um, you know, that's good, and it, hap it started happening like three years in. So uh, I think you still never know as you're going. Um, even with IT Watchdogs, we, 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 we found these odd things, like even two years in. And so IT Watchdogs, we did um, server room climate monitoring. So we made these de physical devices. So I was, I was doing the embedded software, but this was, this was a hardware company that you could, uh, that you, and once we went from a little dongle you plugged into a computer to a rack-mounted thing, uh, sales went up by a lot. Like that's what, that was a key thing, is the rack mount. Then there was another revelation, which again, like is something you can discover, but isn't something you could predict. That, that's more of a random walk. I remember, and this, this is really instructive because it's, it's useful for every single person here, because you, know, you think about pricing, but, but uh, the, one of the biggest things about pricing is how does the customer buy and what can they buy and what's easy for them to buy and what's hard. So that, for example, at IT Watchdogs, we're sitting there with this IT guy. And um, so we have all our stuff because we have devices and we have all these sensors that come off of it that you can buy uh, and you can mix and match and whatever. And he goes, I'll buy a base unit and two of these. And what does that come to? And we're like, oh, for, you know, 489. This is not recurring revenue, right? This is hardware. And so, um, yeah, 489 is like, perfect. That's what I want. And then you guys can come back in a month. Wow. Like, why? And he goes, because if, if I spend less than $500 on my credit card, I don't have to ask permission. Aha. So we rejiggered all our prices so that the normal units you'd want to buy always totaled between like 450 and 490. And we sold a ton of them as long as it didn't go over to like 600. And so like these little, these little things, but how do people buy what is where they're like, so by the way, customer development, why do you talk about price? This is one of the reasons, because when do you have to ask permission? I'll give you a, a separate example. The, the Austin Independent School District, which is government, but still, once you get into that kind of thing, they buy a lot. Um, their similar limit is $20. <laughs> So that's like, never mind, it's just impossible. Another reason why it's dumb to sell to schools is, is if patio hasn't said it enough times. Because um, I have to ask permission for everything that, that can't go well when it's government. So um, um, anyway, so, so this question, you know, what do you have to do to earn something or to try something is critical. All right. Um, I'm going to do one more question, and then we'll go out to the audience. So if you've thought of yours, get them ready. I want to ask you about moving up market. Let's say someone in the audience maybe has, you know, feels like they've hit product market fit maybe at a smaller scale. Um, things are working, and, but their price points are low. Maybe 10, 10, 20, and 50 are their three price points, or 20, 50, and 100. And they're thinking about moving up and you know, trying to get a minimum price point of, say, 99 and kind of moving up from there. Um, when does that make sense to do? Because the, like, the sales process is obviously very different. And I guess, so I guess when does that make sense to do and what things would you typically change in, in moving up to that? I think it, so I think um, some of this depends on the kind of company that you're wanting to build. 
If you want to keep it as one or two founders, and we're going to do this forever, that's great. But it's going to be very hard to service IBM. They just have all these expectations of these things that they want. And so you, you could decide to charge all this money. It doesn't matter, because you won't be able to deliver on the things that they want, which is fine. It's just not a fit for the style of company. And so going up market a bit, like 99 instead of whatever, is smart, because it's better to have you know, a couple hundred customers giving you more money instead of, again, as just a few people. And therefore, you have no time and you know, no resource to do it, et cetera, and do something that fits. Um, so I think that um, I think it's always, it's always good to push prices. I, I have a million stories. I know, I know a lot of people do hear about, about that. Um, I remember I was, um, I was talking to one company that was at Capital Factory. They were selling their product for $300 a year. And I said, great, um, who, who's your customers? And there was people like, like, the, like the, um, the USGA and stuff like that. So I was like, well, what if you've made it $300? Just change year to month, just say per month, just to see what happens. And what happened was nothing. The sales were exactly the same. So that's a 12x price increase. Um, so if you just look at who's coming in and, and doing it, um, you can see that. As another example, there was a guy selling um, a product that, that um, helped you optimize Facebook ads, just a pretty run-of-the-mill thing that you'd expect, right? And he was charging something ridiculous, like $15 a month. It's like, OK. I said, well, just, just, just humor me and, and like make it 30. Just an A-B tester. Do it for a week. What's the worst case? So he did it. And again, there was no change in signups. So I said, great. Now what are you going to do? And he's like, oh my god. Well, now that it's making so much more money, I'm going to buy more ads. I might hire this person. I'm like, no. What you're going to do next is double it again until that stops happening, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, of course, this is the lesson, right? So I think ooching it up makes sense. I think you can ooch. Um, why not? Uh, people are scared. What if my customers say this or that? And the answer is do the right thing. Say you can keep your old price. That's it. Now we're done. What else you got? Um, I also feel like you can, you can drastically change your prices on your customer base when you're small. So for example, there was someone who, um, we both agreed they should 3 or 4x their, their, their price. This is, again, a capital factory company. And so, so what they were worried about is they're like, I really want to go back to all my customers and make them upgrade because this just isn't profitable. And this is, you know, it's just kind of, I think it's the right thing to do, actually. And I think a lot of them would agree. And so we crafted this email. And what it more or less said was this, um, uh, hey, I'm, you know, I'm a single founder, or whatever it was. You know, I want to, there's two of us. <laughs> we're trying to make a go at this. If, if you think about it, you know, we only have a few hundred customers. We're charging you 20 bucks a month, whatever it was. And like, we can't even feed our families. And we realize it's a mistake. And you know, we think that you know, we, we hope that you like our product and you like what, our doing, what we're doing and that you want to support us in continuing to do it. And so we're going to raise our prices from 20 to I think it was you know, 89 or 79 or something like that as the lowest. And they're like, we realize you did not sign up for this. In that, um, and, and we get that. We understand that. And you're right. And if you want to leave, we'll, you know, we'll understand. But we're, we're not you know, pocketing all this money and moving. The, this is literally what we're putting in there, like a person just writing to another person, not a newsletter. right? Um, and um, and you know, so if, if you're in it for the journey with us, we, we want to do this too. We want to hire another engineer and just keep making the product great and be able to answer the phone when you call. And this is going to let us do it. I hope that you're you know, with us on the journey. Sign their names, put their photos on there. right? This is us. This isn't some faceless LL you know, ink or whatever. And something like two out of their hundreds of customers quit. Two. So I'm not saying it's always going to be like that, et cetera. But I really feel like you can play on the fact that people want startups to succeed. And they, uh, they understand this is the American dream and that they can be a part of it. And so when you invite, again, honesty wins most of the time with most things in life, including business, including, you know, this is, this is the first talk I gave here, actually. Um, and this is a great example of being honest, inviting the customers actually along on the journey, because they are, because by the way, your product sucks and your support sucks because you're just two people. And so they're already on the journey. So let's just acknowledge that and say thank you. And, but let's do it together and bring them in emotionally like that. And uh, actually, it works really well. Cool. Okay, we're going to go out to the audience. Mike is in the center here with a microphone, and he'll be uh, walking around. Just raise your hand, and he'll come to you. Uh, hi, my name is Joe, and by a quick show of hands, I'd be really curious to know how many Canadians are in the room. Very cool. Way to go. Love to talk to all of you guys. Um, I've had a, a couple people today made comments about uh, how it would be a great idea to seek out partnerships, uh, build relationships, that sort of thing. That's obviously great advice. Um, I haven't heard anybody say explicitly that um, they should think about building a, a marketing channel, uh, uh, finding resellers, maybe even uh, selling their product through distribution. I, uh, I happen to come from, at 50 years old, I'm old enough to know that 
software obviously got sold that way in the past. Uh, is there an intrinsic reason why that model wouldn't work with um, SaaS related uh, products? Yeah, so I think this is a good question. So um, that model, um, and we, in, at IT Watchdogs, we did used to have resellers, although most of the stuff we did was selling direct. But we had resellers, especially in other countries, such as the UK, where we could ship in bulk over there, and then, and then they could resell it. Um, and we tried to get into some things like gray bar and those kinds of typical VARs. I think, or VARs or, or straight up resellers. Um, I think with software, it's harder for that scheme to succeed because you don't have the troubles that that, that, that sort of um, pyramid, we used to call it pawn life, because it's like each company eats the next. And so just for everybody, because I think a lot of people are probably don't know what gray bar is. And so imagine, and, and we'll just use IT watchdogs as an example. So we, so we have some, um, some, uh, some product that we've built and it's in Mexico. Somehow that's got to get sold to a hospital somewhere. And how does that happen? And so traditionally, it's very hard for a company to contact a customer directly. Um, you know, it, only big companies could afford advertising in the old days. Only big companies could be in newspapers, magazines, TV, oh my God, right? There's only three channels, and it's very expensive to be there and so on. And so it's just not plausible for a startup or a new company to somehow get a personal direct relationship with any customer, consumer, or a larger enterprise. And so you needed to go through someone else who did. And so this is what the reseller is. So these companies, uh, Gray Bar is an example, there's many, where they don't make anything. Their job is they will buy some product from you and put it in their inventory, and they're the ones that have all of the agreements prearranged with all kinds of different companies. And so then they'll sell it. Of course, they want to cut. The typical cut for one of these kind of things is 30%. But they're not the only ones, because you have to get it to gray bar, you have to buy in bulk. If they don't sell it, they want to sell it back to you, depending on how much leverage you have. Either you're footing the bill or they might for a period of time. It's very complicated. But it has to do with physical goods moving from place to place and being put in, in, in warehouses. Um, it has to do with those goods then being delivered and set up, which is where you get value-added resellers or VARs that also do the setup for a fee. Um, and then there's all kinds of stuff in between, shipping and other kinds of vendors and parts to get all this stuff together. And each time you go through one of these steps, it's 30%. And so as an example, at IT Watchdogs, we built this little, um, this is in the late 90s, we built this little, um, um, uh, a board this big that cost us $15 in parts and would web enable a power strip, which at that time was really special and cool. That power strip sold for $3,500. And the reason is that that power strip then cost, uh, cost the power strip manufacturer who put it in there uh, you know, ex, you know, a couple hundred dollars, and then that would go to the distribution center. So now it's a thousand dollars, and that would go to Gray Bar. So now it's fifteen hundred dollars, and then the VAR wants to install it for you. So guess what? Now it's thirty, right? And and so the prices get outrageous, and the companies who invent it get almost nothing. That's the old model. And what's happened with software, but more specifically mo uh, the internet, right? Because even software in the '80s also was, uh, you know, you had to get into a you know, uh, a store. Right, like CompUSA um, for consumer, or the or the software had to be, um, uh, you know, sold by enterprises to, by people like IBM, which is a similar kind of model. But the internet changed everything. With the internet, I don't need gray bar because I don't need inventory for my software, and I don't need gray bar to get between me and the customer. They can just buy from me. Now the enterprises still have their complex buying, uh, you know, processes, which is you know. When you ask like going up market, when you really go up market to enterprise, it's just it's a whole different buying cycle, which people don't write about enough. It's actually not that it's complicated, but it's not that hard. Um, it's just it's just people usually don't have experience with it, but it's not that bad. And um, you know, at Smart Bear, we had hundreds of, of customers, including people like Lockheed Martin and Adobe, Microsoft, Qualcomm, like every Cisco, everybody that had all kinds of complicated buying things. And again, we had zero salespeople, and we just did it all ourselves, right? So you can do it. The fact that me, someone who's never, who never did enterprise sales, can just go sell something to Cisco or make a million dollar sell to Adobe, and I don't need anybody else, that means they're not going to last. So just like booksellers, you know, you know, the big book publishing houses are needed less and less. The internet disintermediates all these middlemen who take a lot of money and are just not necessary when it's bits instead of atoms that you're moving so that you don't care about that and returns or any of that, and you don't care about the relationships because you can go make your own. So you never hear about people talking about it. Now, having said that, usually when people are ignoring something, it means there's an opportunity. So I absolutely believe that Graybar wants to continue selling things and that they're being ignored. 
and that someone who could make an interesting relationship with them maybe could have a channel that other people are overlooking. So I do think at the same time, like at Smart Bear, I had a book, a physical book, and I'd send it out. We sent out over 100,000 copies of the stupid book while everyone was saying, oh no, it's eBooks and PDFs and like you shouldn't do that. Like, no, that's exactly why it's gonna work because it's a book and it's physical. And when you get a package in your office, you're like, this never happens. Why would this happen? I'm gonna open it. Then it's a book. You don't throw away books, that's sacrilegious. So it's a basically a brochure that never gets thrown away. Awesome, let's make it bright red so you notice it. And so I really think that things like going old school in, in uh, whether it's advertisement, distribution, et cetera, whether it's channels, like, um, yeah, it may be wrong for most people, but if, if you can make it work, maybe you have a unique edge. Hey, Jason, um, with a couple significant exits under your belt, what drives you to keep showing up every day? That's a good question. By the way, there was a whole Freakonomics episode about that's a good question, about why people ask it. And it turns out that, or say it, and it turns out that Americans say it like 50 to one versus other people. So there's some kind of like weird American thing that probably buys you time to think um, and compliments the asker, which is always nice, right? No, but it, it, it is a good question. Um, and it's one that I talk about every single time we do. So every three weeks we have new employee orientation and we take new employees through all this stuff and orient them to the company. And uh, this is something I address on the first day to everyone. Because I hope that everyone's at my company for the same reason I am, because you're right, I don't have to be there, I don't have to work again, and yet here I am. So, you know, the, the sort of selfish and absolutely true reason is, I think, look, everyone in this room isn't here again for rational reasons. No way. This is irrational. This is difficult. It's stressful. It's hard on your family. It's probably not going to work. Like, this is not a good idea, right? Um, <laughs> but we, we all, you know, uh, we all have to do it. We have to. We're compelled. It's, we, it's on chromosome 13 or something. There's this sequence that makes us do this, and we must. Um, and it's why people tend to be serial entrepreneurs and why I'm doing the fourth one. Same reason I'm doing the first one, because whatever that was is still there. It didn't go away, right? And that's why people don't go to a beach and sip Mai Tais or whatever. Well, it does sound pretty good right now. Um, so, so, it, so whatever that fundamental, whether it's ego or I know better than everyone else or I don't want a boss or whatever that kind of egotistical, self-centric thing, which it is to start a company, whatever that is is still there and so still want to do it, right? So that's the selfish reason. But um, as WP Engine developed, and again, this wasn't the original idea, so another example of a, the, the fortunate random walk theory, I guess, um, is, is um, at this point, um, fewer than half the people at, at WP Engine have college educations. And that's a pretty amazing thing for you know, almost 300 people. And the fact that we can, we can provide an opportunity for someone that has the right kind of culture, the right kind of, we call it um, attitude, and if this person has the right attitude and aptitude to learn, we'll teach you the stuff. We can teach you DNS, but you can't teach things like empathy or curiosity or account, self-accountability and caring about the people around you. Um, so, so for us to hire people who have those kind of attributes, which we do very intentionally um, in the interview process and even after the fact and, and, and every day, really, um, gives people who should have an opportunity the opportunity that they would not otherwise have. And you know, even from very early when we didn't have a lot of money, you know, of course I, I could put in money, of course I did. And so even early on we had a health plan with same-sex marriage benefits, which is more expensive for every single person, all this stuff, because it's important. And so for us to be able to do that kind, you know, all these kind of things for all these kind of people, that means every job is important. And we've had people who, you know, they just got a mortgage for their, uh, on a house for their family and they, they, would, they say, I, I never thought I could have a, a house ever. Or I never thought I'd leave this state. And now I'm on a, you're sending me on a trip to London to go pitch people and like, I, 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 I didn't even think I would ever be skilled or leave the state or do anything. And, you know, when someone's in your office and they're breaking down because you're giving them that opportunity, that's important. And so why do I come to work every day? Because of that. Now, the same thing, the very similar thing actually is true of our customers. You know, I don't want to make a pitch for WP Engine, but you know, almost no one is technical and can't really set up Word, WordPress or anything you know, well with security and uptime and so on. And so for us to take, but if you're not on the internet, you're invisible, right? And so, um, and so to, to take a person who's a victim to technology or consultants, they don't know how to hire a consultant. It's like, it's like trying to interview a pancreatic surgeon. You know, what do you ask? Like nothing, right? You, you can't. So mo almost everyone is not able to make these decisions. And so for us to help them not be victims is important. Um, so, um, and that's not even, that's not even a, a pitch for WP Engine. I know the Pagely guys are here, they do exa that's, that's exactly the same kind of thing they do for, it, for all of their customers as well. So I think, I think um, 
that's, that's why I come to work. There's a third component where we give back to our communities. It's, that's another long story, but we put some of our stock in a, in a, in a, in a um, nonprofit organization. We do all this um, um, uh, uh, work around Austin and the other places that we have offices in London and San Francisco and San Francisco and uh, San Antonio. We, um, uh, um, uh, anyway, we do it, we give back to WordPress uh, itself and so forth. I think these are the kinds of things that make it worthwhile and fulfilling. And I think that everyone in here um, probably has these kind of higher reasons why we're doing it. We started probably for completely selfish and self-centered reasons. Okay, but now what? What is it that you can do for your customers? Because it's not just saving them time. That's just not enough. And it isn't all you're doing for them. You're enabling them to do something. Or you're create, helping them create a life. They're also, an, say, an entrepreneur trying to make it. And if because of because the uh, uh, I don't know their email campaigns are better because they they they, they listen to this advice about about headlines and, and calls to action and they have this tool and so they can really make it happen. That's what's important. And I don't want to I don't want to speak for for these guys, but I'll bet you hearing the stories of success at this conference is way more fulfilling and fun than another sign up on on uh, on, on a product because it just is. And I think everybody here has those things for their customers. And so zeroing in on what are the what is that thing that's amazing that we're doing for people. I think that is interesting to take a hold of. And when you, and you know, not everyone here wants to hire anyone or, or anything, in, which, is, which is great, right? But if you do, then that's the reason to join the company, that, those things. Because you're not going to pay them that well, they're going to work too hard. It's the same kind of thing, really, reflected into the employees. This isn't going to be kind of a mess. Um, but if we're doing this for people, and we are doing it, to, you know, this tight team is just doing it for individual people. That's amazing, and almost no one on earth has the opportunity to do that in the world. So as entrepreneurs, we're, I mean, I don't, I don't want to make it sound too um, grandiose, but I mean, we almost have an obligation to create things that are important because we can. How many people have the opportunity to be in here? How many people are, luck, look, look how lucky I am, a cisgendered white male born in Austin? Jesus Christ, now? Are you kidding? That's every single opportunity and, 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 and deck stacked in my favor I could possibly have. I almost have an uh, obligation to do something about that. And there's nothing wrong with just making a lot of money, right? The purpose of capitalism is to accumulate capital, no problem. But then what are you gonna do with it? That's maybe the more interesting question. What happens with that? And so I think, well, all right, <laughs> great. Anyway, I think, I think everyone here has that. And, and zeroing on that and articulating that, at least for yourselves, that's, um, that makes this all really important. We have time for one more audience question. Hi. Uh, it's a quick follow-up on the question you just answered. So do, do you... Do you think that you have less stress now that you're on your third or fourth company? Or are you, are you managing in the same way, the same risks and everything? Or do you, you, know, you feel a little bit more laid back now that you have like a you know, good landing, comfortable you know, type of financial uh, prospect? Yeah, you know that's, I mean? that's the, <laughs> I'm not going to say it's a good question. That was a ridiculous question. <laughs> Wait, no, that's not good. No, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I don't have less stress. I do feel more comfortable with certain aspects of the business. So um, I think the, fir the, the first few times you deal with employees and things that come up with employees is, is especially difficult. It never gets easy, but you understand how to do it, and that's helpful. I think also I've worked very hard personally to understand how to manage stress. So I have some, well, um, <laughs> Many days I have less stress than I would otherwise if I didn't do those things. And that could be a whole talk, actually. Maybe it ought to be, because I'm sure we all um, could use advice when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, a lot of people use things like meditation because it helps kind of center and quiet the mind and see things as they are and get a little less emotional and a little distance away. Um, doing things like distancing yourself from something. So if someone says something mean on the internet, that's hurtful and you carry that stress the rest of the day, right? Um, all bloggers, I think, feel that. I certainly do. Um, to be able to distance yourself and say things such as, um, um, you know, they're very angry at me, which is odd if you think about it, because I just wrote something from the heart and then they're pissed. So it's probably they're pissed. They're a pissed person. They're an angry person. It's because uh, it's not like I said anything. Uh, even if they disagree, that's fine. But then why be angry? Like that's kind of that's an interesting reaction. It's probably not about me. It's probably about them. And then you realize, geez, I feel sorry for that person. I, that's terrible to be angry like that. That's that's. Uh, 
that's, a, that's not a nice, that's not a happy way to live. That person may not be happy, and that's um, something to pity. And then, so in other words, by distancing yourself and saying what it is and so on, that can help reduce the stress because you're changing the frame for yourself of what it is. So things like meditation, oddly, I know that sounds weird, sounds kind of new agey and stuff, but that's true, that um, things like meditation help um, create a mindset and help you get into that mindset that's that way. So I think that's useful. Um, I think there's other things, uh, if we're sticking on the, on the Buddhist uh, track, there's things like, um, you know, all things, all things come and, and they are come into existence and then they, they, they end, all things end. That's something that humans don't like to deal with. You know, we've talked about a few times just now about selling the company and what that's like and your identities in it, and that's true and unhealthy, right? Because it will end. All these things will end. All these companies will end. All of us will leave those companies. What will that be like? And, you know, we don't like talking about our own deaths and we don't like talking about the companies ending and so on. And we don't need to dwell on it either and get obsessed. On the other hand, it's the truth. And ignoring that is not healthy either. And so asking, like, so if all things end, then what does it mean about what I should do every day? And you get right to what uh, Patty and other people have been saying. You need to make sure that the journey is the valuable thing and not the end, that the end is simply another thing that happens that's temporary and that the, the whole journey is actually what's important and maybe what you do for other people and so on. Um, and so I think um, these kinds of attitudes, I'm going down this path because I hope it's useful, I hope it's um, useful to people here, um, but I, that has helped me reduce stress more than, I don't know, just ex experience or something like that because I feel experience is, a, is a also a, uh, um, um, it also is, a, is, is, is an anchor because you think, well, I did this before, therefore the world must still be the same way and I know how to do it. Of course, that's not true, <laughs> right? Um, uh, experience is what you get right after you need it, and uh, that never stops being the case. Um, so it's, it, people ask me often, like, well, it's Smart Bear, how'd you get that started? And the answer is because AdWords was new, and I was one of the first ones to use it in my um, you know, universe, and so I was the only ad on the page, and it was five cents. So who cares what I did? Who cares what the logic was? Who cares what happened next? Because none of that world doesn't exist. So whatever I learned about that is gone. It's just like engineers, you know, you know assembly. Well, who cares? You're never going to use that again. That's actually very similar in business. So hopefully some of the things are similar and carry over and are wise. But um, of course, anything might be different. And so you have to keep um, uh, humble and, and keep that uh, beginner's mind, which is another Buddhist saying. So I guess I'm saying you should become a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> But no, it's still very stressful, especially with a, a lot of folks that you have a, um, you feel a personal obligation towards. Um, I think, you know, people say, I just had this conversation last night. Someone said um, um, something about being your own boss. It's like, oh, no, no, no one in this room is their own boss. <laughs> you have your families, you have your, all your customers tell you what to do. Your product is always seeking them, not vice versa in the market, right? The market's your boss. If you have employees, that they're your boss, obviously, because you care about them more than yourself, which is why you pay them more. Um, and so you pay them first anyway. Um, and so, uh, no, you have bosses everywhere. And so the, the whole idea of you're your own boss is actually does not manifest. And that's stressful to have all that. Um, and that doesn't, that stress, at least for me, that doesn't go away. That obligation um, is weighty, and, and, and uh, it doesn't go away for me. Cool. All right, let's, uh, we're wrapping up our Q&A. Let's give Jason a round of applause for that. <laughs> now we're, we're going to move into Smart Bear Live. We have uh, three contestants. I think we might be able to get through all of them. We're going to do about five minutes each, and they're going to come up here. Jason has no prior knowledge of their names, their companies, any of that. And so he's going to go through uh, some Q&A with them. And they typically they have a specific issue that they submitted to us that they want some help with. And that's what he's going to talk to them about. So uh, our first victim, I mean, uh, volunteer is Anders Peterson. Please come to the stage. So um, I'm building a new app and I've invented a new way of uh, managing a team and um, called Time Block. And um, I wanted to hear your comments on this idea. Um, so what's a specific question? <laughs> One sentence. We have five minutes, so we have to be specific. Yeah, sorry, but my brain just froze up. Um, I, I honestly can't remember the specific question I sent in, so, so I'm so sorry about that. I'm, I'm totally fucked up now. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. No, I, yeah, well, 
I, honestly, I just wanted to, to, to hear your comments on my idea and, and see if you can either validate So first of all, am I the target market? Sorry? Am I the target market for the Yes, company? you are. are uh, you my sure? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, my target market is, is mid -sized, small to mid-sized developers. It's a new methodology. And um, I'm just, when I submitted the question, I was still in doubt if I should run with it. Um, I'm not that much in doubt anymore, but, but I'm still wondering. What's the single most important thing you need to work on right now? Um, and if you don't know, then what is, then it's probably, what is the thing that's probably going to kill the business most likely? Uh, running out of cash, building it. So that means getting to revenue quickly? Yeah. Okay. So what's, um, what's hindering you from getting to revenue quickly? Uh, probably me, but I'm thinking also getting an app that people will pay for. How, how many people know about it at all right now? Uh, 25 companies. So that's probably not enough. No. I have seven companies using the method, but not using the app because it's not ready yet. Um, so I should get more companies. <laughs> how much are they paying? $49 per user per month. So that sounds like a lot. How many users on the average company? 10 to 25. So that sounds pretty good. So how many of these companies, like if all 25 were doing that, would you be set? I mean, just set for now? Sorry? If all 25 companies were paying the $45 times the number of people there, would that be sufficient revenue? Yeah. So that's the next thing to do then? Yeah. So what's stopping you from, doing, from getting them up and running? Uh, the app, I haven't built it yet. I'm still building it. Well, then how are the seven people using it? Sorry? How are the seven people using it? Well, I've pitched the method and they started using it in using Excel sheets and, and just doing it. Because it's a method, so you, you don't need the app for, for, for do, using the method. So how about doing that with the other 25? Or at least try, try to do that with the other 25? No? Yeah, but I've pitched it to 25 companies, all liked it. Uh, seven started using it. Uh, a third um, want to use it when the app is ready, and the last third has no use for it, but like the idea and want to help me move on. How much time do you have left? To build the app? Well, to run out of money. <laughs> Three months. I wonder if you could get those, the balance of those companies. So the, I could get. The, the, so the other, I guess, 18 companies that are not paying yet. I wonder if you could get them to pay, because that might extend your runway and give you the time you need to really finish it and get it to their hands. I don't think so, because it's larger companies, enterprises, so they won't be able to pay until the app is ready and they can... So that means you need to get it even faster, because otherwise you'll have the app out, you'll get it in their hands. They'll give you the purchase order months later, then they'll pay that months later, yeah. and meanwhile you're out of money. Yeah. So you've got to start now. Charging. So, well, what you, one of the things you can do, because big companies pay with purchase orders, right? So one of the things you can do is you've got to get that system going. They've got to get you in their vendor system. They've got to get you approved through whatever. Then, the, then their accounts payable department wants to argue with you about price. So it's generally good to quote high so that you can give them a 20% discount and get back to where you wanted anyway. That's a typical trick. Um, and you want to start that now because what, what they can do is they can get the PO issued in their system but not pay it until delivery of the product, which might not be for a few months. But you can get them in their system all the way up to that point, so that when you do deliver it, they can click the box in their system, um, and then that triggers the money, and so you won't have that extra six months that you will otherwise have. So you could start that now. And then the other thing I wonder, just, just uh, wondering aloud, is if 25, out of 25 companies you can find seven that will pay you anyway, that's nice, maybe we can find another 25, 50, 75 companies out of which that kind of, you know, a quarter of them will pay and maybe that's another way to get ahead. Yeah, I, I think I can do that. Um, I'm just holding back so because I haven't built the app, so I'm, I'm kind of nervous that they start using the method and when the app is ready, they're like, no, no, we are fine with the Excel sheets and whatever. Well, as long as they're paying $50 a month. <laughs> Sorry? As long as they're paying $50 a month, who cares maybe? They can use Excel. All right. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, our next next contestant is uh, Mr. James Kennedy of Rubberstamp.io. We saw his site earlier when Patrick was doing a teardown. 
And I'll let James explain what his company is, but should I, should I call out what his, because he put a what are you looking for advice on thing in this doc. Should I read that out now? Maybe I'll just show it to him so he remembers. Yeah, come up on stage, sir. So this is, your, this is what you were asking. Hi, Jason. How are Hi. you? So uh, we have an online purchase order system. Uh, you know, we target companies between 50 and 100 employees. We have 30 customers. Picking up uh, five, four or five customers a month. We're doing that. We only have one lead source that's working, which is paid comparison websites like GetUp and SearchN and places like that. We're getting pretty much all our customers from that. And we're looking for our next uh, channel. So our next target is trying to get to 20. That's our kind of, you know, acquire 20 quest customers a month. So um, what's on the table is, um, you know, doing adverts is what everyone does. And then, you know, we're looking at sp sponsoring specific live events. Um, but we found out that we're, we have to target like CFOs or we feel like most of our customers today are CFOs, which are expensive to get in front of. Um, so... Uh, yeah, uh, and we've also looked at... Um, so this is the question, how do we get in front of them 20 or 50 at a time per month? Well, that would be great, yeah. If, yeah, <laughs> so, um, so I think there's some interesting things. So <clears throat> the CFO, even at a... I mean, if they even have a CFO at 50 to 100, they might, or they might really have a VP of finance acting as that and so on, right? Um, I think even at, uh, even at, say, 80 to 100 people, there's other people in the finance department. It's not just the CFO sitting there with the spreadsheets. And so they may have a controller by then. They probably have some, like, intern or post-intern type folks who, you know, want to be a corporate accountant someday. So maybe they're a junior accountant. Maybe they're doing things like entering in um, uh, receipts and stuff, you know, the kind of menial work that is part of sort of the accounting world's way in which you work yourself up, right, mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. And so what I think is I love it when there's people who are underserved and ignored. So I feel like the person who's entering in those receipts is an ignored person. And it is a little harder to find them because they don't get to go to the conference, which is sort of the point. They're ignored, right? They're sidelined. And on the other hand, if you can, if you can find them, um, they love you to death because you're paying attention and trying to do something for them. Mm -hmm. And if they can bring something like a, a tool to help with purchase orders um, into the company, that's, a, that's actually a notch on their belt. Look, I found this thing. I think it could save us some time. So if you think about like who's so if you think about not trying to go straight to the CFO who's probably busy and so on right and say like I wonder who's the controller the VP of finance a junior accountant I mean even that's probably pretty good the junior accountant's probably having to do some kinds of approvals and such now mm -hmm. so they're actually the one with the pain too and so for them to say, hey, look, I can actually replace half or all of my job with this tool so I can do something, you know, that requires a bigger title and a bigger salary, that's actually a pretty good argument, right? right. And so I love that. I, you know, there's companies um, who target things like EAs for executives because guess what? You can find EAs, which is another one. The EA of the CFO you may be able to target. EAs almost for sure know everybody else who's like sort of in the sphere, mm. right? So the, so the CFO's uh, um, assistant does know all the other players and can pass a message. Mm. Now why would they? Well, okay, this is, it's always a challenge to get in front of people and get their attention quickly. But people like that don't get inundated with lots of stuff because they're ignored. Um, so I think EAs, I think, um, not in your case, but, but in a broader case, office managers, the people that run the front desk, again, they're, they're not valued and ignored by a lot of people, but they actually have a lot of value. Mm. And they, they often can control certain kinds of budgets and things mm. uh, that goes on in the office. So I, I feel like um, there's a company in Austin, actually, who's exploiting that very well. And it's just they're exploding because they, they go to office assistants. This is not quite the same thing, but it's, it's a parallel. And what happens is they all know each other. Like EAs talk to each other. They all, like, uh, um, they, there's um, social groups. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Again, they're usually invisible because they don't, it's not conferences. It's, it's Chardonnay, right? It's a totally different thing. Um, but, it, but it happens. And so, I mean, they found that um, they, they were able to get just a, about a, a one or two dozen EAs on, the platform, on this particular platform and got hundreds afterwards just through word of mouth that they didn't even do just because once you're there, um, it spreads. So I wonder, of course, I don't know, but I wonder who else in the finance department could actually be a catalyst for this and is, un, and is, and is, is usually ignored. Mm. Well, the, I mean, that sort of broadens out who we can go after. But in a way, that makes it sound harder to me because 
you know, at least if it's CFOs, let's say, you know, okay, well, we know generally what they should be caring about, you know, what their job is specifically. Now it's EAs, which I can see, okay, we can just ring them up, which is something we should try. But then uh, another thing which is, which is tangential to that is you have to have like a story to say, right? So we have software, which is pretty boring, let's face it. So we're trying to think, well, what's the hook that can really, you know. Oh, it's get, not boring at all. Because if I'm the controller, my job is to control. Yeah. And that's what purchase orders do is they control the flow of people wanting to order and under what terms and with which vendors and when is it approved and getting all those things ticked and tied. And early on, it's just for general control and, and auditability. Like that's what, we're, that, you know, that's why we actually don't have purchase orders yet, but we probably ought to. Um, and then of course, later on when you're big as Sarbanes-Oxley and other reasons why you must do that, right? Um, and so, no, it, like if, if something gets paid or not approved or um, it, it's on them. And if they're holding up processes inside the company, that's hurting the company from doing business. Mm. The marketing department can't buy, you know, one of your guys' software, right? Because the uh, because somebody doesn't know how to approve it or the but where is in the budget. You forgot that line on the spreadsheet because it wasn't in a tool. Whatever. Like they're hampering the business if they can't do it. And mistakes that they make materially sometimes materially hurt the business. Mm. And. Um, Okay, to be able to wrap, for them to say, I can wrap this up in a tool where I know that's never, ha like this certain workflow is happening, is their job. It's very valuable. So I wouldn't poo-poo and say, eh, software's boring. It's like, no, 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 well, okay, maybe software itself is, is not interesting, but the, the, the solution that you're, that you're <coughs> providing is. Well, we know what we have works in that, you know, people go to GetApp, they're looking for the software, they compare us with everyone else, and then they pick us. Yeah. And then, or if you have, you know, on the, on the keywords, they're looking for that. Now we certain we seem to be kind of plateauing. Maybe we can optimize, but we you know we're getting the number we're getting through those channels. And what I'm thinking is, well, now we have to sort of go broader, like you're saying, and we're uh, so we need something to talk about. Like talking about software, if they don't have that problem, is a thing. And we're thinking, well, you know, we're we're talking about like thinking of like for the CFO, we might say, you know, you're losing control. You don't have control of your company spending. And we're trying to turn that into a story. It's like, the same story. It's just the CFO is not the only person responsible for solving that problem. Mm. They may be ultimately, actually, the CEO is ultimately responsible, by the way. And so if there's control issues in Sarbanes-Oxley, it's not just the CFO that goes to jail. It's also the CEO, yeah. right? So no, there's, there's, there's many people whose responsibility it is. But um, it goes down as well. And so um, no, I agree. You need to find other channels. And it's not just broadening who. That's actually not how I would think about it. I would think of it as being very specific, but different. So instead of being specifically CFOs, what if it's specifically controllers? Yeah. Where, what do they do? Where are they? And um, you know, how can you tell? It's the same story in terms of control and, and, and saving time and so forth, but um, how, how can you attack a different persona Maybe in different chan and maybe in a different way as well. But five per month is very small. There's obviously millions of companies that need to use purchase orders, right? So, I mean, you haven't even started scratching the surface of where, you know, what that could mean. Um, so, and one final thing, and then we're out of time. I, I would say, just throwing it out there, is um, comparison sites cannot be the only way people discover and use these tools. There are ways, um, and, and some people in here are probably experts on this more than I, but there are ways of finding out how are those other people getting customers? Are they running AdWords? Where, where, where's their traffic coming from? And there's sort of some interesting ways to try to figure that out. And it, and it sounds like you don't know where those other companies are getting traffic, because otherwise you would say, well, I'll try that. Um, and so uh, that might be another avenue of saying, well, how else is this happening? Because cle clearly thousands or maybe even uh, hundreds of thousands of companies just in America are going to start using purchase orders every month. And they're doing it some, they're, and they're finding out some way and doing it somehow. Um, like, like for example, what if it's even like an Excel template that they're using? What if you provided a good one but as a foot in the door to do something else? I mean, I don't know, but the point is, what, what are they doing? Where are they going? Because it's, maybe it's not AdWords. Yeah. Okay, well, it's, it's happening somehow, so answering that might help then say, how do I get into whatever they're already doing to seek it? Thanks. Cool, thanks. All right, we are gonna do one more and uh, another five minutes and then we're gonna have our break. We have coffee and snacks and such. Um, our last Smart Bear contestant is Jack Jones with Dev Patrol. Where are you at, Jack? Oh, there you are. Hey. Let's welcome Jack to the stage. Uh, 
Jason, good to meet you. Uh, so, a little bit of history before we get into the question. Well, what's the question? <laughs> The question is when... I know the history. The history is every time I hear collaborate, I think, oh, my stomach kind of feels weird. What's that smell I smell? It's like I got like a Pavlovian reaction to you now. It's really bad. All right, we can skip collaborate. I know it breaks water mains and all of that. Um, I'm actually compelled to start a, a, a business on top of collaborate right now. So it's the, it's the stupidity of, of entrepreneurship coming out. And it's a two-sided marketplace. And... Uh, <laughs> So I know it's idiotic. I don't want to go too much into that. The, so what's the question? The question is, in building uh, a two-sided marketplace, uh, which is going to be hitting the, uh, the, the technical recruiting uh, arena, Patrick. <laughs> I know it's an underserved market. I was an what's enterprise the software so, for a long so, so the question is, yeah. in building that, with, uh, with trying to get an audience, is it, is it Everything in me says to start monetizing immediately, because that's what I've done with my previous two businesses. With a two-sided market, should I be working on building up the, the audience first, building up the market on both sides before I try to monetize, which feels very consumerish and... So is this, is this for finding and placing people? Uh, this is for, it's kind of an okay Cupid, so matching people based on interests with companies that, that But for fit. the purposes of, of hiring? For them. hiring, yes. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of places you can post for free or cheap, and everybody knows that they're low quality. So I feel like in that particular space, the idea of uh, it's free or cheap just implies low quality. Maybe it's not, but it implies it. And on the other hand, as, as, as Patrick w was alluding to, um, but if it, isn't low if it is low quality, we don't need another one of those. It, we already have Monster and Indeed, thank you. Um, right. And but on the other hand, if it is high quality, it's worth a lot of money. And you know we're going to use we're, we're going to use Patrick's thing at, at WP Engine, and uh, he quoted us a big um, number, and we went, well, we know he's going to send us good people, right? And this is kind of his point, I think. But, um, <laughs> but um, so he, Patrick solved one side of the initial marketplace. Scaling won't be Patrick, but he solved the in initial side, which is the demand side, because Patrick, along with his co-founders, but especially him, already has the ears of many really good software developers, and so he's got that part literally solved. He's going to post a couple of times, I'm sure, and something like something between one and ten thousand people are going to go through the game programming thing, and, and then good people will come out the other end. And it, will that scale forever? That's, that's their job to find out if it scales and so on. But it certainly is going to start because they have that side of the marketplace solved. And then because um, uh, Patrick and his co-founders as well had some industry contacts on the other side, that solves the other side. So they already have both sides solved small. And then the only question is, you know, how big and how scalable can that model be? Which is a very good question. Um, so starting from scratch on the marketplace, I would say definitely charge, absolutely, because that demonstrates that the, the fact that they'll pay shows the value. And especially in hiring, um, if it's valuable, people will ha be happy to pay. And there's this precedent set up of what it means if it's free. Um, I, I think. Um, I think it's important for any marketplace at all. This and this is one to work when it's little. So the reason, for example, uh, Etsy is a nice marketplace is uh, when they started, even if there was just like a couple dozen artists, the idea that you could go here and, oh my God, these are people and they are not even t allowed to use paper. They have to make their own paper or something. This is ridiculous. Like it was really cool and interesting and you could buy something and support an artist no matter how many there are. So that means that small scale, that's still a compelling thing to do. And as it grows, it can become stronger, sure, Marketplaces generally do become stronger and more defensible as they grow. Network but working effects. small is important. So if you can place one person at one company, however big you need to make both sides to do that, um, that's really important. Um, and I guarantee you that company wants a second one. Right? Like that's the nature of it. Um, good. So you can get going. So I think just like um, just like what Patrick's doing, I think. Um, I think you can start small, and in fact, it might be easiest when it's small. I mean, to me, the difficulty of the hiring business is scaling it. Yes, of course, you can just cherry pick some companies and cherry pick some people, and like, yes, because you're basically shaking your network, putting it through a very sophisticated sieve, and then, of course, some good people will come out, and of course, it's valuable if you place them, and that's not, like, you should do that because it gets it going, but it actually isn't new information. You haven't right, really learned anything or validated anything. anything. It's, can you do that times a thousand? I mean, you don't want to do it times a thousand. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I know Patrick does. That's why I keep saying that, just because I have that in my mind. But, um, um, but, but scaling it is, is, 
is the hard thing. So I would say um, absolutely charge and charge a good amount. Um, let that you know help to fund the thing. I hope there's a good insight because they, they at least have an insight. I think that's it, it. doesn't have to be unique insight, but it does have to be insightful um, so that you really are finding people. Um, I think. Uh, I think the idea of matching is, is a really good one. I really feel like you know a great employee for WP Engine is a bad one for someone else, and vice versa. We have a lot. Boy, we've we've let people go who are insanely good engineers, but they would be a culture fit at Facebook, where everyone's an asshole, and that's fine. And that's good. That is not a bad thing at all. It's like no, you just need to find your people. That's, we, that's we are, the whole we are reason. people and your people, right? That's the whole I reason love for that. It. Yeah, I love that. I think it's. Uh, I think people love it. I think it's important. Um, Okay, this is a tangent, but it's important. I think um, one of the things you do, you do when, when, when you have employees, even one or even a co-founder, is when people are really unhappy and it's a bad fit and they're not being successful and they're not going to be because you've worked on it, they usually still won't leave because they won't have the initiative because it's a big risk and it's scary and this and that to leave. Everyone in this room has taken plunges so we know it's really, really hard, and most people won't do it, right? Um, and so as, as, the, as the manager, it's your job to discover this, to communicate that, and to have them leave so that they can go be successful, so they can find a place where they can be happy and fulfilled. And you are literally preventing them from being happy and fulfilled by not letting them go. And if you can do it before you even hire them, then it's... That's obviously way better, right? So I really feel like um, that's an important lesson in general, and it certainly... It, Letting someone go is one of the hardest things anyone can ever do. And, and again, for me, again, it doesn't become easier. It becomes more, I understand the mechanics, but it's still emotionally just as hard. But the, the, over and over again, I see that, that people go on and they're successful. And so the idea of, of matching, I think, is an important one. I think people don't do it themselves. And so not only is it a service to companies trying to hire, which it obviously is, but the truth is that it's, it's even more of a service of the person to be placed somewhere where, um, where they will have a better chance of being happy. That's, I mean, that is literally helping people to be more happy, which sounds, again, vast, but this is what I mean. There's always something. This is why I'm everybody. compelled, even compelled though I've got other it. things going on. Good for you. I wish you luck with that. Thank Thanks. you very much. Cheers. So thank you very much, Jason. Let's give a round of applause for Jason.